Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have this really cool unbranded military watch. Now I happen to know that this watch was made by a company called Benrus or Benris. Um, but as you can see, it's got a really neat dial on it. It has a uh, 24 hour kind of on the inside and then the regular 12 hour on the outside. Um, it's got some decent patina, particularly on those hour markers around the outside. I really like the color of the loom. That's the luminous material, the glow in the dark stuff on there. Um, it's not running. And when I try to wind the watch, nothing happens. And I mean, there's like no tension on the crown here. It does let me put it into the setting position, but it will not run and it will not start. I bought this watch off of eBay and uh, I'm restoring it for a friend uh, who, who wants a model like this. And as I mentioned, you can take a look here and see the 12 and then the 24 hour, uh, you know, for military applications. Um, this is a watch that came out in the 60s and uh, was quite popular in, in actually in the Vietnam War. Uh, the, this was not issued by the United States or anybody else as an official military watch, but it was available for sale. And uh, many of the people who were uh, in the war would buy these uh, because they weren't issued watches and you needed one. One of the benefits to this watch, particularly for that type of environment, is if you look at the back, if you look closely, there's no actual case back here. It has the shape of a case back, but it is not, there's, there's no screw down, clicking, nothing like that. And uh, that actually aids in in waterproof. But it does mean that this is a weird watch to disassemble. So in order to get the movement out, we actually have to take the crystal off the front of the watch first, rather than what we normally do, which is take the movement out the back. And for that, I'm gonna use a crystal lift tool. And as you can see, this has very specifically shaped arms that go around and they will actually, I can screw this down so that they will grab the edges of the crystal until like that, you see how it's grabbing the edge and then it'll compress the crystal in a little bit with a few turns and then I can just pop off the crystal just like that. And uh, as you can see, it comes off pretty easily. And there it is. And that's it. So that's how you take off the, the crystal. And again, since this doesn't have a case back, it just has one piece case. It means though that I need to remove the whining crown, and this is, oh, I hate doing this. <laughs> so what this is, is this is a two-piece stem. So the crown is the outside part that you wind, and then the stem, the winding stem is what goes into the movement. And do you see how it has a specific shape on the end of it? That actually mates up with the other end of the stem, and that's how you get, well, oops, <laughs> that's how you get a watch to come apart like that where there is no case back on it, as you can see. Now, as I mentioned, you know, that's a simpler design for the case, and it does mean that it can be more waterproof. There's one less gasket to have to use, but it does mean taking it apart can be a little bit of a pain like you see here. And if you take a close look here, you can see how I can engage the crown and the stem just like that. And that's how it works when it's inside the watch and installed, but the only way to get it apart is just to yank it out of there, which is exactly what I had to do. So we've got some investigation to do here as we restore this watch. Uh, what What is wrong with it? Why isn't it running? And uh, I've also got my eyes on these hands as well, especially look as I turn them over. Do you see how dark that loom has gotten, it's really kind of, they call it loom rot and it really has kind of gone bad. It doesn't really match the outside anymore. Maybe there's something I can do about that as well. But yeah, mechanically speaking, best guess is that the mainspring is broken on this watch. That's usually the case when you can turn the crown and there's no resistance whatsoever. This is a manual wind watch, not an automatic. Movement looks really good though. And you can see it says Benris Watch Company there on the uh, train wheel bridge. Yeah, these watches are great. I've restored one of these before as well. And uh, well, it was a good learning. <laughs> I had to learn a lot to do that one about like the fact that that wasn't a case back and all that. But having done that once before makes this a lot smoother. One interesting thing, if it is the, uh, if it is the mainspring that's broken, sometimes they break and then people just put the watch in a drawer and never touch it again. And, you know, when it comes to servicing a watch like this, 
it gets kind of interesting because as you can see, this movement's in quite good shape. If that was the original mainspring that broke on it, and especially if it didn't last super long, this watch could have just been sitting in a drawer for a long time, which means that it hasn't been serviced and it hasn't been opened up that much. And it means that it's in that much better condition for the movement itself. And this one looks like it's in great condition. Okay. So we take off the crown wheel and the ratchet wheel first. And then just to continue the disassembly, we'll take off the train wheel bridge. And you can see the trainer wheels there and I can remove them. Although, oh, I forgot, oops. I was meant to take off the uh, cannon pinion on the other side of the movement here, but I actually forgot to do it first, which is a little awkward because now I have to turn the movement upside down with the train wheels just kind of hanging. It doesn't damage them, but it's like, let's just say it's not best practices, <laughs> but I just forgot to take off the cannon pinion first. And as it turns out, in most watches, including this one, the center wheel is attached to the cannon pinion. So you need to be able to remove it. And as you see, there was a little bit of a plate there. Now, the cool part is, is that this one's not friction fit. Normally they're actually friction fit on. Uh, so maybe I could have actually taken off that wheel. I don't actually know had I not flipped it over, but I wouldn't have known that until I flipped it over. So there you go. And as you can see all the, uh, the train wheels have stayed in place, so it's all good. And now I can go about actually removing them. And that's the escape wheel coming out last. Now we can turn our attention to the barrel bridge. And underneath that will be the mainspring barrel, and that is where the mainspring is housed and where we'll be able to find out whether that's what the issue is. Again, that's my first assumption, but you never really know, you know, there we go. So that wheel that I'm taking out there, that actually has the friction part that would normally be the cannon pinion attached to it. Okay, now we can take off the pallet fork bridge. And all told this disassembly is going very smoothly. I haven't seen anything else that would make me think that the issue is something other than the mainspring. So that's also hopeful. Oh, and take a look here. So do you see this little part right here? Th that's actually called the hack. And on military watches, those are kind of compulsory because you need to have it so that you can sync up your watch with other people out in the field. Because oftentimes there's like an operation of some sort, right? We're all going to run at this thing at the same time or meet at this certain place or whatever. And you got to have your watches at the same synchronized up, right? And the only way to do that to the second on a mechanical watch like this is to have it hack. And hack just means when you pull the crown out, the watch stops. And so that way you can pull it out at exactly 104 and 15 seconds and then sync that up with somebody else's watch as well. And it's just considered a nice little feature on a watch as well. Not all watches have it. In fact, many don't. Okay, so now that we've got everything taken apart on this side, we can go ahead and uh, put the balance back in place. Oh, I see. Interesting. So the hack is actually pushed over currently, meaning that it's in the way of the wheel. And so it won't let me quite install it because, uh, well, because the hack was engaged. So I'm just gonna move it out of the way. And then we can reinstall the wheel. Okay, now let's take a look inside the mainspring barrel and see what we find. I assume we will find a broken mainspring in here. If not, we've got a lot of work to do. Aha, there it is, the broken mainspring indeed. Okay, so the, in this case, it was the most obvious uh, answer to the problem. And uh, you can see it's just broken right there in the middle. Probably this got overwound. That's what happens when you wind your watch. It gets to the end of where it, it the hook stops it from going any further. And then you kind of keep going, right? You, you push it a little too hard and an older mainspring can become brittle over time. And sure enough, it can just snap like this one did. All right, the rest of the spring actually looks like it was in pretty good shape too. So. 
Nice. Okay, so again, just taking a quick look at the hands, you can see how the loom has turned from its original white all the way into this greenish dark brown. It just looks rotten. Uh, and there's two issues with that. One of them is aesthetic. It just doesn't look very nice and it doesn't match the outside. The other issue is that eventually the loom will fall out and it can work its way into the movement and slow things down. And uh, so I think I may want to address that uh, with this one. Oftentimes I don't, you know, I like to try to keep stuff more original than not, but I might do that this in this case. Um, yeah, so everything now I'm just going to put in a tray because I actually have a watch movement already in the watch cleaning machine. So it has to wait its turn. But the good news is, is his turn. So here we go. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, the basket with all the parts in it just gets plunged down into this cleaning solution here. And then this particular watch cleaning machine oscillates back and forth. See how it goes back and forth. Some of them just spin in one direction, but this one actually oscillates back and forth uh, until the watch is clean. It usually takes about six to eight minutes per cycle. So the one, two, three, and then a drying cycle. And then you'll have nice clean watch parts after that. Now I did want to mention while the watch is getting cleaned up that I do have a Patreon for this channel. It is patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. There's a link down below. And it is the way to support your favorite content creators. If I happen to be one of them, heck, there's a bunch on there too. I wouldn't blame me if you support anybody over there. Um, it's great. It's a direct way to support your favorite content. And that's a really neat thing because you know, in my case, you can get a little bit early look at the videos. I'll what I'll usually do is post up the rough cut, which is pretty, pretty close to the finished product. Like it's, you know, they're, they're not super, super rough. And uh, yeah, so you can get a little early look at it. Anyway, thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, let's take a look at how the parts look after coming out of the watch cleaning machine. Ooh, lovely back in the dust tray there. And uh, they're looking great and ready for reassembly. So that's exciting. Now I am going to have to get a new mainspring for the watch. Uh, as, as I mentioned, it, it was completely broken as you saw. And so, uh, I ordered one up. You can do this by searching for the size, or if you happen to know the movement, you can look that up and get the right one. Uh, mainsprings are a fairly simple device that is a, more complicated than you'd think. Here it is right here. This is what a brand new one looks like. It comes with a metal ring around it to keep it compressed. And then you can use, you know, peg wood or this pointer stick or tweezers or your finger or whatever to uh, push it into the barrel like so, so it never gets unwound. The colored part of that metal disc always faces up. So it, it doesn't matter if it's red or blue or whatever. If it has paint on it, it points upwards. And then I can put the, the barrel arbor in place and also lubricate it before putting the lid back on. Yeah, so the springs, the main springs have a thickness to them, a height to them, a length to them, and then the size of the barrel that they're going to go in. Those are all the measurements you need to get a new one. So even though they look pretty simple, there's quite a lot going on there. All right, this little plastic tool helps me put the lid back on securely. And with that done, we can start the reassembly process on the movement itself. I'll put this intermediate wheel in first because it kind of goes underneath the mainspring barrels, you can see. And before we put on any of the bridges, I'll go ahead and put on the setting lever screw. Little droplet of grease. Just to make sure everything runs smoothly. This is one of my favorite types of repairs. Um, again, I got this watch off of eBay and it had my favorite phrase on it for parts or repair. <laughs> That's what you want to see when you're hunting for watches on eBay as potential candidates to repair. Now, I will warn you that some people take that term like this one. They didn't know what was wrong with it. I was able to figure it out. It's a pretty cheap fix. The mainspring's like 15 bucks or something, you know, and then taking the time to, to restore it and it'll be running again, you know, hopefully by the, before this thing's done. Right. So that's a easy fix, but sometimes it's a disaster and you don't really know what you're going to get. So you do have to be aware of that, but, uh, yeah, for parts or repair, <laughs> I like it when I see that. If you're interested, by the way, in restoring watches, uh, yourself, picking up something off eBay, or if you've got something at home, um, I want you to do it. I, in fact, I started a website with my friend Alex. It's called SutcliffeHanson.com. That's our last names. And uh, the whole point of the site was to make 
toolkits for beginners and even intermediate and advanced people to try out watch restoration. Because I remember when I first started, it was a little bit daunting to try to get in and go, okay, well, what tools do I need? And there's just hundreds of them out there. They're expensive. And uh, so what I did is I went through and curated tools that I use or that I've tested out to make sure that they're good to go. And uh, I've got them in kits and you can check them out. So if you're interested in trying this out as a hobby, I would highly recommend checking it out. There's a link down below for that. So as you can see, this um, bridge, this train wheel bridge actually has four jewels on it. And each of them needs to line up with the pivot hole underneath. It's a bit of a tricky operation. Uh, some of these uh, watch movement designs will only force you to do three for the train wheel bridge, but this one has the full four. And uh, that does make it tricky. This is definitely one of the harder parts about doing a watch. I, as I mentioned, you know, if you want to try it out, you know, like one of the kits at Cyclif Hansen or two of them actually has a watch movement in it that you can use to practice on. And this is a good thing to practice is, is putting on, taking off, putting on, taking out, you know, this uh, train wheel bridge, just because you do have to get all of those lined up underneath. And that can be really tricky. Okay, but it looks like I've done it. Obviously, uh, I've got a good amount of practice under my belt now. I've been doing this hobby for mm, about five years now. So, you know, and I love doing it. And I love that you're here with me as well. It's been quite a journey. <laughs> as you've seen me make all types of mistakes, but also learn a lot along the way. And if you know, slowly but surely, you ex you expand your skill set over time. It's like any other endeavor, you know, especially particularly endeavors that have like a high ceiling. This is definitely one of those where, you know, think about something that you're really good at, maybe your job, or your favorite thing to do when you're not working. And uh, think about how much you know about it, even if it seems easy to you now. If you're a beginner, you have to build that stuff up over time and watchmaking is just like that. Okay. There's always this little washer that goes around the post. I've never actually figured out exactly why. My my assumption is that that's stainless steel and that the post is made of brass because that's what the movement is made out of and that the stainless steel is just a lot more resilient and this uh, crown wheel does get a decent amount of torque on it. So I assume it's just for wear properties that they put that little shim thing around the outside. And remember, this is a reverse threaded screw. That's right. You lefty loosey to turn that one on. It's kind of weird. Okay, now we can put on or turn our attention, I should say, to the other side. Although I'm about to put this wheel on, but look right underneath it. There's actually a capsule right here. And I'm going to need to lubricate that. I, normally, I wait to do all the lubrication at once, but... I'm, this is going to be covered up if I continue. So I think I'm just going to have to do it now. I mean, the wheels are in there. There's no harm in doing it now. So I'll just take out this cap jewel. It has a little setting attached to it. And uh, I can just clean it off real quick. And then put just a tiny little droplet of the finest viscosity oil I have, which is called uh, Mobius. That's a company that makes it 9010. and then I can just drop it right back into place. And then this little tiny screw will hold it in place. And what that'll do is it'll suspend that little droplet of oil directly above the pivot where it needs to be. And that is, that's about as good as you can get. You know, there's three options. There's no jewel at all. There's a whole jewel, which is like, it just has a hole in it. And then there's a whole jewel with a cap jewel above it, which is what we have here. And that's the, the best option. But it requires adding an extra jewel to the movement, which is something. And then also uh, for servicing, it means that you have to do what I just did instead of just using the oiling stick to uh, oil it. Okay, a little bit of HP 1300 as well. The three main oils I use on these movements are kind of small, medium, and large, or light, medium, and heavy, however you want to put it. But the light is the 9010. The medium, the red one that you just saw there, uh, is HP 1300. And then this one is the blue grease. This is the heaviest one. And this is uh, Mobius 9501 grease. 
we actually have uh, uh, an oiling kit as well. It's an add-on kit at Cyclofanson. I, I put together the oils that I use here, um, plus another one uh, as well, plus the oilers and a little cup that you can put them in. So that's you know th that's kind of what I was hoping for when we started the site because I remember how confusing it was for me when I started. But those oils will get you through most restorations. And there's a few specialty oils that you can buy uh, in addition, but you know, for a kit like that, that's all you need. Okay, now this is a little tricky because I got to take this stem and get it inserted so that everything with the keyless works, which is the part I'm working on now, the part of the watch gets lined up properly. And now we can also put on the setting lever, which is also a tricky operation because you actually have to pick up the movement and keep your finger that keeps it up against the setting lever screw and then you can get it seated and then you know you can turn it back over again. All right, this is the yoke. This goes back and forth when you pull out or push in the crown to set the hands. And this is the born to fly spring. <laughs> I always picture this spring with like one of those tattoos that says born to fly <laughs> on it because I, I, these things have jumped away on me. <laughs> It's a very, very strong spring, and it has to be put into place. It, as you can see, it it's up against the yoke, but there's nothing really holding the yoke. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, okay, it only flew like a few inches. The Born to Fly spring lives up to its name. I actually haven't had one jump away in a little while, but as I was saying, you have to get it seated and you can't hold it in place the whole entire time because what well, you need to use your hands to go grab the cover plate that's gonna go over it. So please, please, please. Okay, there. So now there's like this tension in the air because I gotta get this cover plate, which is also the setting lever spring, by the way. There, It's two parts in one. And I gotta get it in place so that the stupid born to fly spring doesn't jump away on me again. And now I'm gonna hold it in place. As you can see, using my pointer stick, that thing's not going anywhere. Again, at least. I did get lucky there. Uh, the good thing about the Born to Fly spring is that it's big, uh, at least as far as watch parts go. So it is quite visible and like you can pick it up with a magnet, that type of stuff. Some of the smaller springs on a watch movement, that isn't the case. They're, they're too small to really uh, pick up that easily with your eyes. Okay, well, this looks like it's working okay just on a quick test to make sure that Things are spinning and turning properly. And that means that I can put a little bit more of that Mobius 9501 grease on the keyless works. Again, this is metal on metal and it's held under tension. So you really wanna use the thick grease for that part of it. There's one more cover plate to put on here. It just goes over the minute wheel and the hour wheel. And it's got little tiny baby screws. Look at those things. Okay, cool. So that is now in place. And now we can finish the cleaning process. So when it comes to uh, the pallet fork, as well as the balance, sometimes I'll give them an extra clean here. Um, the pallet fork particularly has two end stones in it that are, they're jewels, they're rubies. And they're actually held on by shellac, which is a material that you melt under heat and then it hardens and becomes kind of like an adhesive that will hold those in. And there is a slight risk to the shellac if you put it in the watch cleaning machine. Uh, the shellac can become soft in, under some circumstances. I actually haven't found that to be the case myself, but I have seen it happen. So I'll just do it this way where I put the pallet fork into this one dip it's called, it's like a cleaning solution. And then I can just agitate it and then get it out really quick. And then it, it's safe that way. But you know, you have to clean every single part. It's there's something really cathartic about working on watches. You know, you, you, you get to clean every single part. I mean, it, it's not very often that you get to do that type of thing uh, in your life. You know, I mean, you don't do that with really anything else right? Like where you would take something you own and completely disassemble it and then completely clean it and then put it back together again. And, and it does feel pretty cool. Okay. Let's give it another quick wind here because I need to get a little bit of power to make sure that this 
pellet fork goes back and forth on its own like that. So basically, as long as it's under some tension, it'll jump back and forth uh, accordingly, and then I can tighten down the bridge over it. And that brings us to the moment of truth here. We have replaced the mainspring, and everything else looked totally fine, so let's see if it'll run. Okay. A little bit of something there. Huh. Well, it's not really... Oh, maybe a little? It's weird. It doesn't feel like it's seating correctly. I'm going to take a look at it a little bit closer here. What is going on? Why won't this thing? Oh, I think I know what's going on. Yeah. Okay, this stinks. I actually have to take apart a bunch of what we've already done because I think the hack is out of alignment. So there it is right there with that big screw on top of it. Yes. See, so I had to push it over so that it would engage when I pull out and push in the crown and stem. It looks like it was on the other side of that and it was just stuck. And that means it was stuck in the, well, we don't really call it this, this but the off position basically. So let's reinstall everything again. I'll kind of just cruise through this here because uh, you know what I'm doing already. And uh, this happens sometimes right? It's, it's, you got to be patient and you do need to be willing to go back and redo something that, that didn't get done properly, just like this right here. That said, we do get to figure out if this thing's going to run now, finally. So let's get this thing into place and see if it wants to go. Ooh, it looks like it's close. Oh, oh, well, it started. Yeah, there we go. Now it's running. Okay, we got one back, baby. That's nice. That's the best feeling, by the way. It doesn't matter if the watch was running. If it wasn't, it always feels good to see that balance kick back up again. You can talk to any watchmaker, any watch restore, anybody that works on these things. It really is a, such a satisfying feeling to uh, put one of these things back together. Let's give it a quick test. It should stop when I pull out the crown. Uh... It should stop when I pull out the crown. Oh, the hack isn't working. What is going on with the hack? That That is a, look, it, it is a non-essential part of the watch. Like you can run the watch perfectly fine without the hacking function work, but it's part of what a military watch is supposed to be. So what is going on now? Oh, I have to take it back apart. Oh, I actually see what's going on with it too. I think it's going to be a little too difficult but to show, but it's there's a uh, the post that actually touches it was bent. And I think it was bent out of the way so that it couldn't touch the wheel. Because basically, you know, what's actually happening here, by the way, when that little lever pops over, there's a tiny post that touches the edge, the rim of that wheel right there, the balance wheel, and stops the whole movement. That's all it takes. So I've just gently tweaked it back, hopefully into place, and we'll give it another run. It looks like it's running free right now, but it should be. And we can give it another little wind here to see if it'll kick back up for us. And it does. Good, good, good. And we can test it as well. Please stop. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, it only took three times disassembling and reassembling this movement to get it going again. Now we can put some oil on the upper jewels here as well as the lower. It just takes a little tiny bit like this. Yeah, yeah, about like that. And then of course we need to do the balance jewel as well, which has its own special setting. And this little weird looking, almost like flower shaped brass spring on the top is actually what protects your watch if you drop it. It's called a shock protection system and it is a spring. And uh, if you drop your watch, that little pivot that's sticking out, you'll see it right underneath here, right there dancing around, that's what breaks most commonly. And that spring allows, the spring absorbs 
the movement as the watch hits the ground or the hard surface that it's going to hit. And it means that instead of that pivot breaking off, the spring just flexes. And that also makes it a lot easier to service watches because you can just take off the spring and then get to this jewel here. Now I'm using a piece of pegwood that I've carved to have a flat end to clean off the surface of that because that jewel is meant to be flat and perfectly clean before you put the lubrication on it. And if you don't, uh, well, it can, I mean, look, I'll be honest, the watch will still run, but uh, not optimally and not for as long as it should. So now I can put a droplet of oil in the center of that, and then I can just grab the whole jewel, it's called, and just kind of squish it down like a sandwich. And once I do that, the oil will be suspended in the middle, and I can boink, drop it right there back into place. And then the only thing left to do is to replace that shock spring and put it back into place as well. Done. So that'll, that'll work really well. Now, after some fine tuning, let's see how it does on the time grapher. This will tell us how well the watch is performing. Ooh, very nice. Zero seconds a day, 0.1 beat error and pretty decent amplitude at 254. Look at this thing. It's keeping like one second a day. Wow. So now I got to do something about these hands. They're just bugging me. It's always a tough decision when it comes to doing a watch restoration about what to do with the hands. But in this case, this loom is just rotten. And I don't really like the way it looks particularly. And so I am gonna re-loom these hands. And that means first off, taking off the loom that exists. And as you can see, it just has that kind of sickly green color. Now take a look at the loom plots on the outside, those triangles, that beautiful golden color. That's like my favorite color. It's the same color as like an Arnold Palmer. <laughs> it's just like my favorite thing to drink too. If you ever have one of those, it's iced tea and lemonade. Highly recommended. And this is how you remove the loom. I'm just gonna use a pair of tweezers and start scraping out the loom. And as you can see, it is gross. Also, it is not going to uh, glow anymore either. This is called tritium loom which was used um, after they realized that radium loom, which is what they used uh, prior to this, was extremely toxic and dangerous. This stuff is technically radioactive, but it has a much, much shorter half-life. It's like 12 years. So at this point, it's basically inert. But that's it. That's how you take the, uh, the loom out, just gently as you can do it. And it's very satisfying <laughs> to take that loom out. I'm not going to lie. It just takes a little bit of, uh, you know, repetitions to get it all set up. But I've got actually a cool product that I found, and I've been waiting for the right project to try it out on. And this is the one. And it is a set of loom that has been pigmented with the idea of matching different ages of loom, you're never really gonna get it perfect, perfect, but like you want it to kind of match up, you know, with the, the other loom on the dial, for example. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take some Rotico, that's that kind of silly putty stuff, and I can suspend the hands there. Now take a look at what I've done. This is a, a spare hands that I've used as testers to put the different colors of the loom that I got on them so that I know what they look like after the loom is all dried up. And I can use that as a gauge to try to match up with what I think would match best with the dial that I've got. And so I'm gonna pick this one out of these, you know, a bunch of little vials that I got. And uh, we'll see how it does. I, I actually haven't used this product yet, but I've been excited to for a while. And uh, we're gonna find out today how it does. So first I put a little bit of the luminous powder into this mixing bowl, and then I can use what's called a binder. This is just a clear liquid that you mix with the powder to create like a paste or a fluid. You can then apply it to the hand, and then as the binder dries, it leaves, it, it makes it like a, a rigid surface so that the um, loom will stay in place, and hopefully for a very long time. Now, it's always a little tricky because I put a little bit too much of the liquid binder in, so the solution that I, or the, the mix that I'm making here is too thin and I need it to be a little bit thicker. So I just have to add a little bit more 
of the powder. And then if I add a little bit too much powder, I can add a little bit, you know, a drop or two of the binder. And you keep going back and forth until you get just the right consistency. And this one, said that you want it to be a little on the thicker side, actually. Uh, most of them are, are not that way, but this one said you actually do want it to be closer to like a paste that has liquid on it and that it'll perform best if you use it that way. And so what I can do now is take an oiler, that stick is actually the same type of stick that you use to put the oil into the pivots, and I can gently spread out the loom over the back of the hand. And then since it is a liquid, it will fill into the gaps of the hand automatically. And, uh, and then hopefully they'll look really good. So that's what we're going to do here. As you can see, this is on the pasty side. Normally I prefer to have the loom be a one step uh, closer to, to liquid than this, but the instructions that I got uh, with this said that you should you should err towards it being a little bit more on the solid side So that's what I'm doing here. And I mean this is an experiment just like anything else Like I said, I did try them out on that set of hands that I made so that I could get used to working with it a little bit And then also get an idea of what color it actually produced when it was dried off But this is a, a little bit more tricky because I have to use the oiler here to kind of spread it out a little more normally the capillary action will bring it between the uh, the edges and it'll kind of fill in those gaps on its own, but this one I'm doing it on my own. So after 24 hours of waiting, mm, that looks pretty good from this side. Let's see how they look on the other side. Hey, that's actually not too bad. Looks like a little bit of the white paint came off, but I guess that was to be expected. Huh, these are kind of cool actually. I like that color. That looks, that looks like aged tritium. That, that is exactly the type of color that you would expect from a watch really of this age. In fact, that pointer tip there was actually just the original tritium and it matches up pretty good. So we'll set those aside and install them shortly here. But first we'll put on the hour wheel, make sure that it's engaged. There we go. And now I can put on the dial. There you can get another look at those original markers that faded to that really deep color. I love that color. And hopefully the hands will match up a little bit better than when the watch first came in. And now we can install the hands and see how they look on the dial. Oh, not too bad. You can see the markers are like a little bit deeper of an orange color than, than the hand, but not too bad. It is fairly typical for the hands to age at a little bit of a different clip than the, uh, Loom plots is what they're called, but that's pretty close actually. We'll see how it looks when it's all presented. The thing I hate, I just can't stand it, is when people put brand new stark white loom on a watch like this. So you have these really creamy, nice loom plots and then the hands are just like boom in your face. And I don't like that at all. I'd rather leave them kind of old and dirty than, uh, than do it that way. But this has gotten us much, much closer. Just a quick check to make sure that the hands can move and then we can put on the uh, seconds hand here. Yeah, I think I like that loom. I'm gonna call this a success. I, I wonder if I could even tweak it a little bit, you know, uh, myself beyond just the formulation that it has. I'm always thinking about how to improve these type of things. All right, we can put the movement ring on. Because remember, this whole movement assembly goes into the case full stop, just like this. Because remember, we've got to put the crystal on after. <laughs> it's a weird procedure for this watch. Okay, now I can click in this, the uh, crown here and just make sure that the hands can move and all that. And that looks fine to me. So now the crystal, this is the old crystal, but I do want to replace the crystal. I usually do whenever I can. I just love the idea of like a brand new crystal showing off this cool dial. But again, it doesn't just sit into place. We do have to replace it in very similar fashion to how we took it off. Now first, I do need to use an air blower and yes, even sometimes a little bit of Rotico to make sure that there's any dust or debris gets removed. You don't want that sitting on the dial. It'll drive you nuts forever. And what you can use is this little holder. This actually comes with the crystal press. 
And what you do is you sort of cinch the crystal in so that it's held in place. And also that metal plate is just raised up slightly. And what that lets you do is take the crystal press once again, uh, open up the jaws of it, put it down, and now the jaws are gonna grip the edges but not underneath the crystal because it's sitting in this little holder. And again, that's really important because the under rim there needs to be able to uh, go into the case where it seats itself. And then all I have to do is tighten down the crystal from the outside, make sure that it's engaged with the case here, and once it is, I can just unscrew the jaws and the crystal will just expand into place just like that. And by the way, take a look at the hands. They look pretty good. Not perfection, like it's not 10 out of 10, but it's like eight. Like they look much, much better than before. And I don't think that your eye would naturally go, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. You know, they, they're close enough so that, you know, they pass, right? You're like, oh yeah, that looks fine. That You wouldn't uh, assume that those are have been relumed, which I think is really great. And I've got other colors too. So that's something you can look forward to seeing more of. I'm, I'm impressed by this stuff. Um, only a couple of things left to do to this watch. First one is I wanna replace the strap because it didn't come with one. And so I am going to measure up the lugs. These ones are 18 millimeters. And then I've got these uh, spring bars and they're just by size. These are the, the kind of normal ones. There's a bunch of different types, but uh, these are just the normal ones that go in a normal watch. And uh, as you can see, I can just attach the strap using the two brand new spring bars. I'll usually switch out the spring bars regardless just because they're so cheap and it's good to replace them just to make sure that they're holding on strong. And with that, take a look at this watch. Isn't this a cool watch? I'm really impressed. Uh, again, the loom stuff ended up being really cool. And I think the watch itself is really pretty, but also very functional. This is a type of watch you could wear every single day. That leaves only one thing to test out, and that is the new loom. Let's see how it actually does. I've got a little light that I can shine on it. And you can see, interestingly, the outside ones light up, but look, they don't hold the light at all, and the new ones do. Hey, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah, they hold on to the light pretty well. The tritium loom on the outside is unfortunately done. That's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. If you want to find me on Instagram, I am wristwatch underscore revival. And I just wanted to say thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to go on this watch restoration journey with me. And we'll see you next time.